Good evening, everybody. Thank you for being here. This is really exciting. My name is Heather Day. I'm the Executive Director of Community Alliance for Global Justice. And on behalf of CAGJ and our program, Augur Watch, I want to give you all a very, very warm welcome. Thank you for coming. So we have come together in Seattle because we're at the front door of the Gates Foundation here. Our locally based group, Augur Watch, was founded in 2007 by CAGJ because we learned that the Gates Foundation was um, putting millions of dollars into a so-called new green revolution, which means that they're pushing chemically based agriculture and GMOs onto Africa. And it means much more than that, which you'll learn more about tonight. But um, Augur Watch stands in, aims to stand in solidarity with the African food movement who are, who are fighting for food sovereignty, who are resisting um, this huge push of industrial agriculture. Um, and the summit represents several years of relationship building with people on the continent um, and with people in the U.S. who are committed to fighting for food sovereignty. Food sovereignty, if you're not familiar with the term, I'll just give you, you'll again learn more about it um, from our partners tonight. But in the words of sort of the founding declaration of Nyaleni, which was a gathering in Mali in 2007, it is the right of peoples to healthy and culturally appropriate food produced through ecologically sound and sustainable methods and their right to define their own food and agriculture systems. We're really so very honored that leaders from several, several African organizations have traveled so far um, to help us develop strategies to help make us more effective. We're building a more effective campaign together through this summit. Um, and tonight, it really is a rare opportunity to hear directly from some of the most powerful and important social movement leaders from Africa. So thank you for being here, for listening, and thank you for being here to help us amplify our campaign. Um, our interaction already over the last two days is, is clearly strengthening our work. Um, and we just want to acknowledge that um, Community Alliance for Global Justice is a really proud member of the U.S. Food Sovereignty Alliance. Um, which is a fairly new alliance that um, many of the organizations here tonight are members of. Um, and we're just proud to be part of a food sovereignty movement both throughout the U.S., throughout the Northwest, um, and of course internationally. Um, one of the affiliations that we're most proud of is um, because we're members of the National Family Farm Coalition, who's represented here tonight, we're also affiliated with La Via Campesina, the international movement of, of peasants, smallholder, smallholder farmers, farm workers, um, who introduced the idea of food sovereignty to the world. So we're really proud of that. And we have the international coordinator of La Via Campesina here, Elizabeth Mapofu. So I can't really emphasize how fortunate we feel and how incredibly honored I am um, to get to welcome you to this event. And finally, Eric Hulti Menes, who's the Executive Director of Food First and who will moderate our panel tonight. Well, this is the year of family farming, according to the United Nations, and it's good, you know, that they recognize that. Um, I'm here to um, sort of set the, the context for our speakers. and. Uh, we're very happy that family farmers and people who work with family farmers have come all the way over from the continent of Africa to engage us in a conversation about the Green Revolution and about the Gates Foundation and their project for a new Green Revolution in Africa called Agro, which I'm sure many of you are already familiar with. But I just wanted to make a comment or two about the Green Revolution because what we've heard about the Green Revolution is that it saved a billion people from hunger. Well, that's probably true. What we have not heard about the Green Revolution, and this is something that Food First, the organization that I work for, discovered 40 years ago, was that the Green Revolution also drove about a billion people into the ranks of the hungry. And who were these people? These were farmers, basically, the proposal of the Green Revolution is to transfer the industrial model of production from the global north to the global south. Why? Because the global north had saturated its markets. We could no longer sell any more pesticides or hybrid seeds or fertilizers to our farmers because we'd already sold everything we could 
And so we had a crisis of accumulation and we had to break down the food systems and the agricultural systems in the global south so they would buy these products. So the first thing that happened, of course, was that those who could afford those products bought them. There was a tremendous flush of food. It brought down the price of grains and it drove the small farmers out of business. And when it did that, they were the ones who went hungry. So the Green Revolution during its heyday reduced hunger by about 11 or 12 percent. It also, hunger increased by 11 or 12 percent during that period. But we don't hear about that. But it's important to keep that in mind because today what we hear is the Green Revolution was a tremendous success in Asia and in Latin America. But poor Africa, we must have forgotten about it. They missed the benefits of the Green Revolution. And so now we must bring them the Green Revolution. And that's what AGRA is all about. It's bringing the Green Revolution to Africa because somehow Africa was missed. Well, why was Africa missed? Was it actually missed? The answer is, of course, no, not at all. The Center for International Agricultural Research, CGIR, um, which is a consortium of all the international agricultural research centers around the world, funded by the Rockefeller and Ford Foundations and our tax dollars, basically tried for 20 years to get the Green Revolution going in Africa. They spent a third of their budget for over 20 years trying to kickstart the Green Revolution in Africa, and they couldn't do it. So it wasn't that Africa was bypassed by the Green Revolution, it failed. Well, about six years ago, the Gates Foundation and Yara Company, which is a fertilizer, international fertilizer company, got together and decided, you know, we've really got to kickstart the Green Revolution in Africa again. And of course, Yada was all for this because this means they can sell a lot of fertilizers. So they had an international convention, conference, of fertilizer organizations in Africa. And the Gates Foundation was there, along with the Ford and the Rockefeller Foundations. And they decided to launch a new green revolution for Africa. Why? To sell fertilizers. To sell pesticides. To sell hybrids and eventually GMO seeds. And the rationale for all of this was, of course, not we need to sell our products in Africa. The rationale was we need to feed the world. Poor Africa. It missed the Green Revolution and the poor Africans are starving. And we need to feed them. And you still hear this. You hear this time and time again from USAID, from the World Bank, from Bill Gates, from, you know, we need to increase food productivity by 50, by 100% or by 70% by 2050 or the world is going to starve. We, 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 we need to feed the world. Who is this we? Do you know who feeds this world today? Do you know who feeds the world today? 70% of the world's food comes from peasant farmers. Actually, less than 15% of the world's food crosses any borders at all. Do you know who the hungriest people in the world today are? They are peasant farmers. So on one hand, they feed the world. On the other hand, they're the hungriest. And do you know who they are? They're mostly women. So women feed the world, and women are the ones who are going the most hungry. And yet somehow, we have to feed the world. So what this really is about, you see, is about market share. But you can't say that. It's about those who have 15% of the market share of the world's food and who want the rest of it. And so the rationale for this is that we have to feed the world. And to do that, we have to bring them the green revolution. Well... This is all about food security for the world. And our guests tonight aren't going to be talking much about food security. They're going to be talking about food sovereignty. And I'm not going to sit here and tell you what the difference between food security and food sovereignty is. 
you can already sort of guess where things are going. But I will tell you what one urban farmer in Oakland told me one day. An underserved community in Oakland, this African-American farmer feeding his community said, when I asked him, well, what do you think the difference between food security and food sovereignty is? He said, dude, I can be food secure in jail. <laughs> so we are talking about freedom, the freedom to feed ourselves. And we have an extraordinary panel tonight, and I just want to briefly introduce them because they've got quite a lot to say. First, I'd like to in introduce Milan Belay from the Alliance for Food Sovereignty in Africa and from Melka, Ethiopia. He's the founder and director of Melka. It's an indigenous NGO working on issues of agroecology, intergenerational learning, advocacy, and livelihood improvement of local and indigenous peoples. He also coordinates the Alliance for Food Sovereignty for Africa, and that's a network of networks in Africa. He's been working over two decades on the issues of intergenerational learning and biocultural diversity, sustainable agriculture, the right of local communities for seed to seed and food sovereignty, and in forest issues. He has a PhD in environmental learning, a master's degree in tourism and conservation, and a bachelor's in biology. Next, I'd like to, like to introduce Miriam Mayette from the African Center for Biosafety in South Africa. She's the founder and executive director of the African Center for Biosafety, or the ACB. It's a nonprofit organization based in Johannesburg in South Africa. The ACB carries out research analysis, advocacy, and information sharing with key organizations in the network to foster and promote informed engagement with policies, and informed and decision-making that control production, distribution, and access to food and resources. Ms. Mayette holds a BA and law degrees from the University of Witherwastrand and in South Africa. And finally, it's a great pleasure and honor It's also a great pleasure and honor to introduce Elizabeth Mpofu from Simsof and La Via Campesina, Africa, in Zimbabwe. Elizabeth is the current general coordinator of La Via Campesina's International Coordinating Committee. She's a founding member of Zimbabwe's Smallholder Organic Farmers Forum, Simsof, and Eastern Southern Smallholders Farmers Forum, ESAF, organizations which promote sustainable farming practices. She chairs Simsof and is the former chairperson of ASAF. In the 80s and 90s, she worked for Aztrek and later became the chairperson. She's an organic farmer herself, an activist, and she works tirelessly for the betterment of smallholder farmers throughout Africa. Now, we asked our panelists tonight to address four issues, and I have absolutely no control about how they're going to do this. But the first thing we ask them is, what is the best work being done to address food security and food sovereignty, environmental degradation, livelihoods in your region and in your country? We also ask them to tell us how the Gates Foundation was relating to this very good work that was happening in their countries or in their region. And they want, we want to know how they think the Gates Foundation's influence related to the US government and US corporations who are trying to influence African development. We want information from the ground. And finally, we would like them to tell us what they think the role of international solidarity is in advancing food sovereignty in their countries and in their region. So, without any further ado, I'd like to uh, invite Million to start. The microphone is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eric. 
Thank you for coming. I feel deeply honored to be invited to speak uh, uh, here. I am also grateful to the organizers of this event. Um, I think, uh, what comes to your mind when you think about Africa? Um, in terms of analysis, we don't differ that much with foundations like uh, Gates Foundation. There is population increase in Africa. We have to feed uh, the increasing number of people. Uh, we have a problem of land degradation. Um, we have uh, urbanization. Urbanization is a new and rising problem in Africa because it's taking over farmlands and increasing number of youths are migrating to urban areas. So there are farmlands which do not have farmers and the feeding habit of people is changing. And um, to compound that all, we have climate change, which is not uh, our own doing. We have also this image problem. You know, when people think about Africa, they think about a hungry continent, a dirty continent, a disease-ridden continent, HIV, now Ebola, a continent ravaged by war, and, uh, and uh, kudetas. So, to solve all these problems that I've mentioned, there are two visions, two contrasting visions. One vision, oh, we call it uh, a productivist vision. It's a vision of Agra. What is this vision about? To, to answer the problems that I've outlined. They say that, yeah, this is a very easy problem to feed African population, the growing number of African population, we have to produce hybrid seed. Now, the winning narrative is also we have to uh, use modern biotechnology, basically genetical engineering, uh, to produce hybrid seeds, you know, highly performing seeds to feed Africa. We have to pump the soils with agrochemicals and we have to use irrigation. And since African knowledge, the knowledge of the people is backward, we have to substitute it with no, new forms of knowledge and new forms of agriculture. So that is their vision. And um, we all know what this vision has brought to this world. Uh, there is a, an increase in greenhouse gases you know, it's a nitrogen-based agriculture. And nitrogen is much more uh, powerful than carbon, di carbon dioxide to, in to affect uh, climate change. Um, we have pollution, pollution of rivers, uh, pollution of um, other water bodies, pollution of soil, pollution of air. And this whole system operates through control control of seed, control of market, the control of any uh, agricultural inputs. And there is a, a decrease in biodiversity. It's a monoculture. And uh, where it happened, there is a, a, a displacement of the people. It impoverishes people. There is plenty of food probably coming out of the system, but uh, yeah, the food is nutritionally impoverished, nutritionally poor. So that's the result of this kind of vision. So what, are, what kind of vision are we proposing? As an alliance for food sovereignty in Africa, working in 50 countries, um, out of 54 countries in Africa, working over, with over 20 networks, uh, for example, to tell you the extent of the membership of AFSA, uh, we have Pelham Regional. Pelham Regional works in 10 African countries. 
one of the members works in Kenya, Pelham, Kenya. They have 43 organizations that they work with them and 2 million and 100,000 members. One single entity. And if you multiply that with all the number of uh, networks and members that we have, we are working with over 40 million, 50 million uh, African communities. We have uh, groups working solely with women. We have uh, groups working with indigenous people. We have gr groups working with farmers and civil society organizations. So we have started collecting cases, cases to make the case for agroecology. Let me tell you two stories, two short stories. One story is about this uh, rice intensification. Uh, the system of rice intensification, it was sta started in Madagascar, um, then it went to Burundi, Rwanda. Now Ethiopia is doing it. Basically what it is, is instead of broadcasting your seed, you plant in a row. So simply by planting in a row, the productivity of the land has increased threefold and fourfold. This is so, so significant, for example, for an Ethiopian farmer. Mostly you get from one hectare of land probably 10 quintals of teff. One quintal of teff costs 1,000, let's say. So normally the farmer gets 10,000 per. But if the productivity increases fourfold, it means 40,000 per. That's significant. And and it's working. Over 50,000 farmers in Ethiopia are involved in this. Another story is a story from Kenya. It's called uh, Sand Dams. So they, they are uh, um, putting dams where rainwater was, was, uh, was flowing forcefully. So when you dam it, the, the soil is sandy soil then the water stays there, and sand purifies water. So mostly, yeah, previously, women were having a huge problem with shortage of water. They have to walk kilometers to get uh, water, um, and uh, waterborne disease was rampant in, the, in that area. Because of sand damming, a simple technology, then they can get uh, water just uh, near to, to their household, Minutes. I don't believe this. You can take so, of mine. <laughs> so, and they, 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 they uh, increased productivity. And uh, they, they could plant diverse uh, uh, crops and vegetables. And because of that, they, they could increase the nutritional content of their food, the food on the table. So we have collected uh, close to 50 cases now from all over Africa, and this will continue. What's the commonality among all these cases? There is an enhanced social capacity, the capacity of women. Why is, that, why is it that happening? It's not displacing the knowledge that they have. You know, that knowledge accumulated over thousands of years. It's strengthening that knowledge. There is an increase in income because they, they're not using their money to buy fertilizers or agrochemicals. And uh, there is increase in productivity because of that. There is increase in income also. Then is a, a diversified healthy food. And there is also improved soil fertility because they are, they are doing uh, composting and manuring and, and you name it. But what's uh, shocking for us is even if uh, the Gates Foundation pumps a lot of money into agriculture, it's a peanut as we have seen it today as compared to the kind of money that they are putting in other sections. Uh, but it's a lot of money nonetheless. The Gates Foundation, the vision of Gates Foundation and other foundations are led to that does not support this kind of agriculture. Is no support, or very minute support for agroecology. 
And uh, the agroecology agri kind of agriculture and the kind of agriculture that we are promoting is becoming an international agenda. Now, uh, quite, quite recently, I think in, uh, in September, there was a huge meeting at FAO, FAO level. So uh, I see a clash between do, these two forms of agriculture, uh, what works for us, for African women, for African youth, for African uh, families, is agroecology, not the other vision. And um, uh, at last, I will implore you to support organizations like uh, AgraWatch and KAGG. And we work all in solidarity, okay? So thanks again for coming. Miriam, it's, it's all yours. So good evening, good people of Seattle. I'm really happy to be back again with you. The last time I was here was in 1999, and I'm sure many of you were together with me on the streets. Um, a first ground rule. All difficult questions relating to my presentation have to be directed to my colleagues who will join us later. <laughs> so I want to say that I have come really to share with you um, our profound objection to the violence of the agrarian transformation taking place in Africa, funded uh, by the Gates Foundation, your government, and many other governments uh, linked to the old hub of capitalism like Germany, Italy, France. So your government is not unique in pushing the Green Revolution, nor is the Gates Foundation, but the Gates Foundation is what I call the kingpin. The kingpin who is in charge of the coordination of the various Green Revolution initiatives taking place in Africa. And I want to address you on two issues, particularly relating to what we've witnessed uh, based on our uh, research. The first is in relation to um, the criminalization, the displacing of our farmer, managed seed systems. And the second, I want to talk to you a little bit about the GM Banana project that the Gates is funding. Now, I want you to reimagine Africa as this vi a vibrant continent where farmers are in control of their seed systems, are proud of their knowledge systems, share seeds from generation to generation, oral tradition, self-reliant on um, a, a huge diversity of seeds under their control where women play an important role in uh, production decisions, seed selection and breeding, and where um, our local food economies uh, find their roots, and then imagine displacement taking place by a very violent, aggressive Green Revolution project funded by Inter Alia, the Gates Foundation. And coupled with that is a very close partnership between the Gates and around 80 African seed companies, which we believe will be the target for what I call corporate occupation by the big multinational companies. And we've already seen the beginnings of the corporate control and concentration of our seed sector. Already Monsanto controls most of the hybrid maize market in southern Africa, 
And we can see that through the acquisition of South Africa's maize um, company, Pena, that Pioneer Hybrid will also make a lot of incursions into Africa. So we see and we fear a great deal of social dislocation, of collapse of our farming systems. We see in the future, um, and it's already happened, land grabs. You know, investment has become a euphemism for land grabs, dispossession, dislocation of our communities. And it's almost as if, and I don't want to sound like a conspiracy theorist or alarmist, but this is what's happening on the ground, where peasant farming systems, which have been, become reviled by the likes of Gates as being backward and responsible for poverty and starvation in Africa, it's almost as if there's a concerted effort to make these systems obsolete, do away with them. They're ugly, they're backward, they have to go, and they have to go now. We've already seen in the US and, and in industrialized agriculture countries like South Africa, where farmers have become completely divorced from production decisions, where these decisions are made in laboratories or in faraway boardrooms. And I think that we will see a very similar situation play itself out in Africa with catastrophic consequences because 80% of our population live in rural areas. And about 70% of um, uh, income is generated from agriculture. So what is going to happen? when they empty out our rural areas? Where are all these people going to go? Because already what we've seen with Green Revolution projects is that they're aimed principally at about 2% of farmers because it's a very expensive a, a, a technological package for farmers to buy into when we're talking about m tens of millions of small-scale resource poor farmers who cannot afford the high cost of inputs unless they're subsidized by our governments or your taxpayer money, and the money comes into the public purse and out to agribusiness to pay Monsanto and Syngenta for hybrid or improved seed fertilizers and pesticides. So that's really what Gates is funding. That's the agrarian vision, and that's what's being played out in Africa. So I want you to take home the message that there are Africans, farmer organizations that are outraged. We are angry because these decisions have been made, maybe here in Seattle or elsewhere, imposed on us in a very patronizing, patriarchal, violent way. Like we children, that, a solu that they have designed a solution for us as to how they can fix up something that's broken. The second thing I want to address you on is this is a super banana project. Have you heard about that? It's a genetically engineered banana project funded by the Gates Foundation. And they have invested millions of dollars. Um, and it's very similar to this golden rice that's, that they've been trying to commercialize since the mid-80s, and it's gone nowhere after huge expenditure of money. And what I want you to, um, to also take home is that <clears throat> they've started feeding trials of the GM banana at Iowa State University on US citizens. And the the idea is to commercially introduce this and grow it in Uganda and other countries in East Africa where the GM, where banana is a staple food. And what they're saying is that they will then enable Ugandans and other East Africans to access vitamin A because it's genetically engineered to produce beta carotene which the body converts into vitamin A as if a diverse diet won't give Africans 
<laughs> the vitamin A um, they can get. So, I mean, Ugandans grow like 27 varieties or more of banana. So, I think that we, we're looking very much at this project as also a way to garner a lot of support from scientists who are involved in the project, who benefit from um, capacity building, dining and dancing, research funding, to pry open countries that are close to GM, like Uganda, to really capture the sought after commercial markets of GM cotton and maize. So it's a kind of a Trojan horse. And so I'm going to leave it there because I think my time is run out and um, give my friend and sister from my neighbor Zimbabwe um, a chance to speak. Thank you so much for listening. Okay, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, maybe before I even go further with my brief uh, speech, I just want to thank the organizers for inviting me to settle. And I just shared with my colleagues the reception I received the day I arrived in this city. I've been to New York, I've been to California, San Francisco, but when I just stepped my feet in Seattle at the airport, I felt a very different culture. I felt I'm here in Seattle as a citizen of Seattle. So I really want to appreciate that. And I'm really honored to share with you what Lavia Kambasina is fighting against because we won't waste time explaining what is food sovereignty, why food sovereignty, but what exactly are we fighting against? We are fighting against these transnational corporations. We are fighting against WTO, the free trade agreements. Why? We have seen that they are very influential to our African governments to the extent that they are pushing for policies which don't support our farming systems, our indigenous knowledge farming systems. They are also promoting the GMOs. GMOs are flooding into our continent. Does that mean we Africans, we don't know what to do with our own resources? They are coming to grab our resources, our natural sources. We are not benefiting from our natural sources from Africa. But these corporations are coming to grab our land, take our diamonds, our gold, all those resources. The most challenge which we are really facing as farmers, as peasants, is the way they are trying to influence our African governments to grow crops which are for biofuels, not food. Do we eat biofuels? We really want food. Why should they talk of food security? We don't want food security. Why? Food security is just, you just want to see food, plenty of food, regardless of how it was produced. Is it healthy food? You don't even dare think about that. And what is that which we should think of doing together? I have the feeling all of us in this house today, we are already via campesinos. We are already members of La Via Campesina. 
and the fight we are fighting, we are going to fight together. We have to strengthen our resilience together. We also need to build the capacity of our farmers, our peasants, so that we are able at the end of the day to stand in front of uh, what is this big organization which we are talking about? <laughs> the Gates Foundation. What is Gates Foundation? <laughs> All the farmers should be able to stand and voice to protect our rights. We really want to control our land, to control our seeds to produce the food we want, healthy food the way we want. No one should come and tell us to produce food. We are big enough, we are human enough. We know what we want. And I think if this continues, this uh, money syndrome to rule the world, the struggle won't come to an end. We know we don't have money, but we have the capacity, we have the, res the resources. We are as many as, I, 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 can't, I can't say the numbers, but because like for instance, right now, La Via Campesina, we are talking of more than 200 million farmers. from 70 countries, from 170 organizations. Imagine a world where that number could just focus more on agroecological farming systems, plus you. What type of a world were we going to witness? In these few words, globalize up, Globalize the struggle. Thank you. So I'd like to invite our other African colleagues who are here to please join us on the stage. Please. <laughs> oh, if you could all come up and then I'll introduce you once you're here. Thank you. There are stairs on either side. So first, I'd like to introduce my good friend, Daniel Mengi, who hosted myself and Travis when we were, my husband, Travis, when we went to Kenya. <laughs> Daniel is with Growth Partners Africa and the Kenya Food Rights Alliance. We also have with us tonight, Marcia Andrews with the Trust for Community Organization and Education from South Africa. Marianne Bassi with Friends of the Earth Africa from Nigeria. <laughs> Herschel Milford with the Surplus People Project and Agrarian Reform for Food Sovereignty Campaign South Africa. <laughs> and Bridget Mugambe with the Southern and Eastern... A no, that was her former alliance <laughs> for affiliation. I'm sorry, that's wrong in the program. She is now with, also, along with Million, the African Food Sovereignty Alliance, and she is from Uganda. <laughs> so we'd like to invite each of you, if you'd like, to comment for two or three minutes um, on what you've heard so far or on the questions that were presented. Um, and then we will go to a question and answer period. Um, and you have a wireless mic um, that you can pass to each other. Um, thank you, Hida. 
And um, thank you to everyone for turning up for this event. Um, we are really delighted uh, and glad um, that you're able to attend. I just want to take my two minutes to um, speak to, uh, I think, what all the three key speakers have talked about, but mainly to what uh, Million talked about and Miriam. And I just want to try and um, put the question out there, who is, um, gets agriculture vision really benefiting as we see it from our perspective? Don't worry, I'm going to try and respond to that question so you don't need to raise your hands or anything. And um, I just want to, to, to give you an example, speaking to especially what some of the, the two projects that Mariam talked about, the whole issue of um, the vitamin A banana in Uganda. And this speaks to me a lot um, because I'm Ugandan and this is my staple food and we produce a lot of bananas. We are the second largest producer of bananas. And bananas are like everything to us, food, culture, and you know, we do a lot with bananas. We brew alcohol from there, we do ceremonies around there, marriage, funeral rites, bath ceremonies. We do quite a lot with all these bananas. And we have so many varieties, over 50 of them. And all these have indigenous names, have indigenous purposes, have culture attachments. So it is a very critical thing to us. And why I put the question who this is benefiting is if you look at, for example, this project of vitamin A banana by, that gets its funding, it is targeting um, increasing vitamin A consumption for young children. And in my culture, young children don't like bananas. They, children below five years, do not like bananas because we eat bananas while hot. So it doesn't speak to them. When you eat bananas while cold, then it is something different. It's close to cassava or potato or... So children learn how to eat bananas when they are seven or eight or nine. So you, you, if you're bringing a project to address needs of children under five years, and you're putting in all this money, and you do not understand how this food is consumed, well, then you might as well throw that money into a ditch. That's why we are all seated here and questioning Gates' vision for agriculture in Africa. I'll just simply say that. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Uh, it's an honor to be here. Uh, I come from South Africa, and I think it would be irresponsible not to raise the issue of the land question that our country is facing in that 20 years in a democracy, we still see landlessness and um, lack of access. So we can't speak about food sovereignty without speaking about agrarian transformation. And so that's the area that um, myself, as a leader of an organization, advocates with others um, uh, for. And so that struggle continues around access to land. And then linked to... Um, my sister Elizabeth, around just getting the message across that many farmers and social movements and food movements are fighting back. So there's not a passive acceptance of the status quo. There is a resistance, a strong resistance, a strong resilience. And I want to echo what Melanie is saying about changing that picture and vision that's really resonating in um, a country in South Africa, uh, but also in the rest of the continent. So I would ask you all to continue your fight together with uh, such an amazing organization um, uh, for the struggle for social justice, food sovereignty, and agrarian transformation. Thank you very much. Good evening. It's also my privilege to be here with you tonight and to say thank you to the organizers. It's been really good to be here with you and to learn and to share. So Eric um, started off this evening by speaking about 
the Green Revolution and about AGRA. So when we look at AGRA and the Green Revolution, I think um, for us as Africans, we see it as a, another form, another phase of colonialism, another wave that's coming to take over um, the last parts of what is really African, our food, our land, and our sovereignty. So we're saying that Africa has fed itself for a long time. Africa will continue to feed itself. What we need is not charity and more investment of the kinds that's been imposed on us. We need solidarity. We need learning together from you, from the peasant farmers, from the food movements, all these small markets that exist here, from the community to community programs. That's what we need. People to people solidarity, not corporate takeover. So we say no. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. I want to thank uh, the organizers for bringing us here. And if you want to support something, I think you support the Community for Alliance for Global Justice. They are doing a very good job. It's a good place to put in money, good place to support with all that we have. And I want to use this opportunity to thank my host, Professor Brandon and his amiable partner, Nikki. We see at least their bed, I'm sure they are some in the crowd. Thank you so much. And uh, that brings me to what I want to say briefly. When I got into their home, the first thing he asked me was, uh, what do you want to eat and what do you, what do you want? I mean, this is their home. They could give me whatever they have, but they choose to ask me what I want and to make me comfortable. Gates Foundation, Monsanto's and his allies are not asking us that question. They are coming to Africa and they are detecting to us what they think we want. I mean, if you want to help me, if I say I am cold, don't give me ice cream. Give me a coat. Don't decide for me. Those questions are not being asked, and we really feel very insulted. They are coming, and like all my brothers and sisters have said there, and destroying our diets. I live in Nigeria, and I, I work, um, work with an organization called Friends of the Earth, and I'm part of the alliance. We are in 77 countries. And we have this crop in West Africa that we eat. It's called cassava. I don't know how many of us know cassava. It's a... Uh, we call it an orphan crop because if you, don't, if you can't afford any other thing, you can afford to eat cassava. We eat it in different forms, liquid, solid, in whatever forms you can afford to. And it grows in arid conditions. Gates and his brothers are saying, oh, we're going to fortify this cassava for you. So you don't need to um, eat it the way you eat. You're going to put uh, vitamins inside and your ancestors were not very creative or God was not very good, so... We're going to do you a favor, and we're going to polish this crop. So, and they're telling us, we eat cassava with soup. We don't eat it alone. And they're telling us, now you can eat cassava alone. We feel we are being insulted. If you want to help me, if you want to help our people, ask us what we want. Don't assume. You can as well throw the money into your drain. We feel the corporations are there, not for us, but they are there for themselves. We also feel that if they want to do experiments, they should not do it in our environment, not in our intestines, but they can continue in their labs. They shouldn't do it anywhere that we are. And then finally, before I hand this mic to my brother here, we, want, we can't fight this battle alone. We need all your support. We need all your encouragement because the battle is fierce. We have our voices. We have hope, we believe. But they have, we are up against people who have resources, who feel we are nothing, and because they have the means and, and the support of our government, they can treat us whatever we want. Again, we believe in food sovereignty. We believe that we can eat what we want, how we want it, and the way we like it. 
It should not be like the Zambia case where there was famine and the people said, give us money, let us buy food from the, 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 the south where there is food. And they said, no, you must take food from the states. So that is not help. If you are helping me, ask me the kind of help I need and you'll be helping me. Thank you. There's a beautiful lake in East Africa. It's the second largest lake in the world, fresh water. And tonight I met two lovely ladies, uh, Shirley and Carol. The reason I'm starting there is because uh, Carol spent some good years in Kakamega, very close to the lake when she was at a prime age of 45, and she stayed there for five years. We have a green revolution project that has started there, and they call themselves Dominion, Dominion Farms. And they've taken up a swamp where fish used to go uh, spawn and lay their eggs, to repopulate Lake Victoria. So the swamp is cleared out, so the fish are no longer uh, laying their eggs. And so people used to eat a lot of fish, and they were food secure. It was a lot of protein. I don't know whether you know tilapia. It's the center of biodiversity for this wonderful fish that we all love. It's gone, because Dominion has dominated that area, They've put in green agriculture kind of farming, green revolution. Lots of fertilizers, lots of chemicals. It's poisoned the whole waterway. And now the people that used to eat all the fish for free don't find any at all anymore. I also met another very good friend of mine this night. His name is uh, Matthew McDermott. I don't know where you are. He's uh, from the Seattle Till Farm Works, and they're doing a lot of organic agriculture, which is feeding your co-op, and you're eating healthy, wonderful vegetables and food. So you may have dominion dominating in producing lots of rice, but it's empty calories, it's not very good. And you've exchanged what was beautiful food for what is poisonous food. Thank you. Well, okay. I can explain, I'm sorry. So, um, thank you, thank you, thank you, you beautiful people. So we are now going to open it to the floor for questions. Um, there's a microphone on each side. Thank you, Heather. B before I uh, open the floor for questions, I just want to support what Heather has just said. Because I work for Food First, the Institute for Food and Development Policy. We were started by Frances Moore LePay 40 years ago. She wrote Diet for a Small Planet, in which she pointed out that we already have enough food to feed every man, woman, and child one and a half times over. The problem is hunger of hunger is not scarcity, it's injustice. That was true 40 years ago, it's still true today. And Food First has been able to carry this message and do the research around these issues for 40 years, thanks to its membership. We receive almost no foundation funding. We receive no government funding, no corporate funding. And yet for 40 years, we've been able to provide you with the in-depth analysis regarding the root causes of hunger. I think it's extremely important to support an organization like CAGJ. If they're going to have an independent stance in relation to the Green Revolution, in relation to AGRA, in relation to the Gates Foundation, it's practically impossible to do this in any substantive way without the support of membership. Our membership organizations are the ones we can control. 
They're the ones outside of the influence of philanthropy capitalism, outside of the influence of the big corporations. They're the ones who belong to you. So please support CAGJ. Um, I, Food First knows from experience this is the only way to keep an independent voice alive in times like today. This has been very uh, informative, and I came in here particularly because I'm interested in what the Gates Foundation is doing, because the more I learn about them, the more frightened I get. And here in Seattle, they are deified. Bill Gates is deified. All the billionaires are deified. The billionaires are eating the world. What can we do here in Seattle to help bring the Infra true information about what's going on with the Gates Foundation with public health, with international public health, with destroying the public schools, um, with destroying our city, turning it into the a city of the rich. It's, it's this, this activity is it's most pronounced in Africa, I believe, but it's not limited to Africa. What can we do in Seattle to bring more attention to the fact that the Gates Foundation is evil? Let, let's, let's take a few questions, and then we're going to respond. Yeah, um, Mr. Belay mentioned as one of the five challenges that Africa is facing a uh, population increase. So I guess there's some sort of measure of, of agreement about that. However, and I, I agree that agribusiness is really misusing that reason as to push, you know, uh, uh, agribusiness onto Africa, which is, you know, a very nefarious way of seeing it. Nonetheless, my question is, if we preserve and enhance sustainable local traditional agriculture, which I'm totally behind, are we nonetheless, sooner or later, does it matter, 20 years, 100 years, whatever it might be, even at the currently low per capita energy usage in those regions, hitting a population carrying capacity? And if that's the case, if you agree with that statement, what can we do to nip that in the butt now and look ahead of time, because sooner or later, I mean, you say we can feed the world one and a half times over. Well, if we increase by another 50%, then we hit that limit. And of course, there's also climate change and other things beyond our control. I'm really interested in hearing what your thoughts on that are long-term, really thinking long-term to uh, address the question of local carrying capacity, because locally, carrying capacity varies from region to region. And I would like to answer or uh, your thoughts on that. Thank you. Let's take one more question, please. Uh, my name is Steve Hoffman with the Freedom Socialist Party, and um, I just wonder what panelists think about whether we can really address these problems while we allow the profit motive to run the world. And so do folks in your countries think socialism is a direction to go to address the total control of the corporations that you're so eloquently describing and so fiercely resisting? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Would uh, panelists like to address these issues? So we, we have questions regarding Gates's influence in the U.S. and what to do okay. about population and socialism. I'm a socialist. <laughs> so I, I want to start off also by um, um, abusing the mic for half, half a second by saying. A great thanks to my um, uh, house host. Thank you very much. It's been great. Um, the first question that I, I want to tackle is um, the question of gates. So the sister asked with uh, what do we do about um, the Bill Gates, but Bill Gates is only one, as you correctly say. So we have a, um, a system where it's not only a Bill Gates, but of course tonight we're talking specifically about the contribution, the negative contribution of Bill Gates to many different aspects of society. I, I think that part of what we must do is what's already been done by AgroWatch, is to watch, to monitor, to expose, 
to all the time keep the Bill Gateses of this world in the public domain. That is our task as citizens. Whether he, and the good things as well as the bad things. I think it's important that we put this in the public domain and that we engage with it all the time as citizens. And that we, nothing that they must, that they do must be um, kept under wraps. We must force on these um, corporations and the people like Gates a transparency. We must make them accountable, not only for the things that they do in Africa, but for the profits they make. How are they making these profits? How are they acquiring this wealth? And how are they redistributing this wealth? So I think we, 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 we have to play that role. Why is it that there is such um, enormous wealth and such enormous poverty and inequality and inequity. So I think that's an important thing. And I think that uh, one of the things we said today in our conference is the fact that um, Mr. Gates has made some contributions in key spheres. HIV, AIDS, malaria, public health, education, and now food. These are the most critical issues, things to human beings. And we must ask why um, has he chosen these and why the interventions that he has. So I think that's, that's uh, an important, uh, perhaps, task for all of us. It's not only to some, but it's everybody's task. I, I will come back, otherwise I'll hog the mic, so I, I'll give others a chance. Um, thank you. I want to speak uh, to the question on population. I'm sorry if I, I missed something. You are speaking so fast, so, but um, I generally understood uh, what, you, what I think the question that you're trying to put across. And um, I just want to say that um, I think Africa's population problem is not per se the numbers of the people. The problem we have with population in Africa is uh, the quality of population that is coming up. One, we have, um, I think half of our population are young people, and these young people's lives have been defeated by the capitalist tendencies that have, you know, been thrown full swing into African countries. So we have young people who are finishing universities and everything is on the market. They can't get employment, they can't buy land, they can't buy food, they can't get housing because this whole capitalist system has taken over everything. So it is not that our population is too much. I think there is land where we can fit, we can produce more people and we'll still fit within there. And I just want to talk a, a little about um, this whole capitalism and liberalization that is going on within Africa. So many uh, governments, including the US government, have pushed African governments to liberalize, to open up their markets, so everyone can come into Africa and set up a business and take their money out and uh, give people crap employment and dodge taxes and evade and avoid taxes and do all these things without any limitation. And I'll give you an example. The US government has proposed a trade investment partnership agreement with the countries within the East African region. And these are the things they are demanding for. You want um, equal treatment with local companies in Uganda, and equal treatment means tax holidays, uh, means access to resources like land, you know, and all these things. So these are the things that are frustrating the population the bigger majority of the population in Africa. And that is why the population is uh, becoming a problem to us. It is not the numbers, it is the quality and the system, the problems around it. Yeah. You know, I always become very nervous when, when um, people start talking about developing countries and population 
it always carries some kind of connotation that we have too many children and issues around carrying capacity of land. And I think that we need to turn the question around and say, how do we address the systemic issues that contribute to inequality, that militate against people's ability to access adequate, good quality, culturally appropriate food? And what is standing in the way of ecologically sustainable and socially just solutions? And I think if we start from there, then I think the solutions will flow. But if we start from Africa, you've got a problem, you've got too many people, and we need to feed, you know, I think that we're going to get into all kinds of problems. So I would just caution us to really rethink, um, um, because we can get into a very, we can get, be entrapped by some of the rationale for why we need outside help, why we need quick fix technologies, why we need increase in yield. It becomes very, very tricky, and I think it's going to take us down a very dangerous path. Thank you. Are we ready for more questions? Or? Yeah. Okay. We have the next question, please. My name is Betsy Bell, and one of the reasons I came tonight was to find out how you have engaged the Gates Foundation. Have you had conversations with individuals within the organization? And I was actually hoping that I might join you in a protest in front of the Gates Foundation. <laughs> we have another question, please. Uh, first, my name is Carol. And I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Kenya for a number of years. And I am so glad to see all of you. I know it's hard work. I was there. I know what it's like. I personally would like to apologize for every McDonald's that comes into your urban areas, <laughs> KFC, Subway. I am so sorry. Second, I'm a member of the Seattle Raging Grannies. If anybody wants us to protest in front of the Gates Foundation, I'm sure we can arrange that. Yes, my question, sorry. My question, um, as a Peace Corps volunteer, does anybody have, quickly, just a, a short story or two of what your organization has done on the ground, maybe a program you've managed to start, information you've given to farmers or women's groups or just anything um, that would help us really, really understand. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Let's take a question from here from the right. Uh, yes. I'm David. Um, I would like to ask uh, one question. First and foremost, I would like to appreciate your efforts in trying to do the right things. Uh, my question is because Africa most are led by people who are brutal. So you are now fighting two forces. One forces with big money, and then there are forces within Africa who is going to accept, get the money, and then let all everything go the way they want. They don't care if in the long run, whether the continent is going to suffer, they don't care. So what are your strategies in addressing that? Thank you. I, I was actually reflecting about uh, the last question before he even asked it. Um, what is the enemy of Africa? I think uh, the elites, the elites, elites, elites. The elites in Africa are one of the enemies of Africa. We are very much closer to the Western community than to our community. And what is the source of that? The source of that is Western education. We're taught basically, uh, was all Western miseducation anyway. We're taught basically to cherish Western ways of life, 
to look up to the West for, for solutions in Africa. That's it. So we never go to our local community to listen. Um, we have agricultural colleagues in our countries, and what do they teach? Do they teach uh, graduates to go to the community and to learn the kind of farming that is practiced in their own community, or do they teach them Western forms of agriculture? It is Western forms of agriculture. And I agree with you, my brother, that we are fighting two enemies, and the worst enemy is the enemy inside, our friends. Yeah, I agree. Thank you. Elizabeth. Okay, maybe to answer the question of what exactly is happening on the ground, I'll briefly speak of myself, what exactly I'm doing. Uh, when we got our pieces of land during the land reform program, we were already practicing what we called organic farming. Now, after getting our pieces of land, we came together as a group and we agreed we are not going to use any fertilizers. Let's revive the way our ancestors were producing their own food using what surrounded them. That means our natural sources. We, we re realized that our seeds were no longer available, but we did some research going, uh, visiting our elders, asking for our own open pollinated variety seeds, those indigenous seeds, and we got a few, we planted, and up to now, that was 2000, 2003, and up to now, we are just using those same seeds. We are not going to buy hybrid seeds in the shops. <laughs> we are not buying any fertilizers any pesticides. And the advantage we are now witnessing is when we have a, a minimum, minimum rainfall or little rainfall, those who use fertilizers, they are not going to reap even a single cup of grain. But for us who don't use fertilizer, we produce enough for our children to feed our families. And uh, taking for example, which happened this past season, in some areas there were no rains. Even in our area, the rains were very minimum. But to tell you the truth, I got four tons of sorghum, two tons of maize, one ton of pill millet. What about the groundnuts? What about the roundnuts? What about the beans? Do you think we can go hungry? No. And La Via Cambasina, in Africa we have uh, established four agroecological schools where farmers are training, are getting trainings, and also practicing farmer-to-farmer -farmer exchange, uh, what you can call field schools. That is how we are spreading the information. We have 40 schools in all the countries of Via Cambasina, and the biggest one is in Brazil, the MST. So we are hoping to establish more schools and more trainings. And we can really even tell the Gates Foundation that look what we have on the ground, it's practical, and even our governments. And we are now also holding what we call seed shows, seed fairs, food fairs, where we also invite even the Minister of Agriculture and some relevant ministries and other civil society organizations to come and witness what is happening on the ground. So together we can do it. Thank you. So I, I am part of a regional uh, movement 
um, in southern Africa. There are eight countries that's part of the movement. We call ourselves the Rural Women's Assembly. The slogan of the Rural Women's Assembly is, we are the guardians of land, life, seeds, and love. And we are a movement in the region. Elizabeth is part of it, some of the people sitting here. We are a movement of uh, farmers, peasant women, farm workers, fishers. And it's a movement where women share their knowledge. So when we're talking about the, um, what do we do practically, there are lots and lots of practical things that the women do around food uh, sovereignty, around seed saving, uh, many, many different things. But we also fight. We also fight for women's access and control over land because control and access over land for rural women is a real big issue. So how women can have their own land, how they can control it, and how they can use it for their own economic um, so rights is, is a key issue. So this is, I think, an important part of very practical things that we do. We fight and we say we have answers, we have solutions to the climate issue. We know how to, um, to save water. Many, many very different things that women can do. So tonight, it's, there's not enough time to go into the practical programs that, that women are, are involved in. So the second small issue I want to talk on, someone asked about socialism. I can't remember which is. So I, I cannot talk for the whole region, and I certainly think none of us can talk for the whole of Africa. But I'll talk about South Africa. So in South Africa, we believe that change is important. We believe that it is the system of inequality, a system that has been... that exists that favors the rich, that favors the powerful, and that favors a small elite, the 1% that's creating the problems in the world. And I don't know what you want to call it, but we believe that system that favors the 1% must change so that everybody, the 100%, can have what is rightfully ours and we can share in the wealth of the world. So whatever system you want to call it, that's what we want to see must happen. Um, I just want to chip into what Million said about um, the enemy within. Um, it's true we have some very bad leaders in Africa, but then we have to, let me cast our mind back. I spent some time with my grandmother and I was speaking about corruption. And he said, in Africa, we don't have a word called corruption. It was never a word like that. You have a bad person or a good person. And most of these things, policies that are being implemented by our government are driven from outside. First of all, they came to Nigeria and they said, oh, you don't have enough land. That is why you need to grow GMOs to feed your burgeoning population. Then, some years later, they came back and said, you have so much land, you need to go grow agrofoils. So this land can give you money and everything. They come in and define these policies for us. And our government, because they are interested in dollars, try to turn to these corporations to the detriment of our people. Yes, I can fight with the enemy within because we know how to, we can hold them to ransom. Remember in January 2012, we held our government when they tried to increase the foil and Everybody went out of the streets and uh, retreated their steps. But when it's coming from the outside, that is why we need your support. Because they are so big, they are not operating from our territories. They are calling the shots and defining what should happen. They are tying most of the projects to it. If you don't do this, we're not going to give you money. And our government stupidly are dancing to it. So it's, yes, it's, it's corrupt, but they are being driven from governments from outside and with the corporations they are working with. So we need all your help. We can handle our governments, but we cannot handle some of these corporations without your help.
My name is Jacqueline, and if I was wearing my regular name tag, it would say community volunteer. I wear multiple hats. Anyway, I have been involved in the social justice community society, whatever you want to call it, since my school helped integrate MLK's Children's Brigade in the 50s. I was also a freedom rider in the 60s, and much to my family's chagrin, I went into rehab rather than high finance. <laughs> anyway, I would like to make two points. Uh, there is a lovely foundation. It's being led by Ocean Robbins and his dad, John Robbins, the former co-founder of Baskin and Robbins, and they are going the opposite direction of corporate America. The second thing I would like to mention is NCRS, a government website that talks about soil conservation and biodiversity. Thank you. I, I wanted to address one of the other questions regarding whether the group had met with the Gates Foundation. Um, and we should say that uh, AgriWatch attempted to arrange a meeting between our African partners and the Gates Foundation, a high-level meeting because, quite frankly, we have some high-level partners. Um, those of you who may have been, may be familiar with the struggles for food sovereignty and food justice and environmental justice around the world probably recognize our guests. They're, they're, they are internationally prominent in these struggles. So when we tried to have a substantive meeting with the Gates Foundation, we basically were unsuccessful. They kept, they bumped us down, and we couldn't meet with Bill Gates, we couldn't meet with any of the heads of the, um, of the programs. And so we were unable to arrange a meeting between people who could speak of substantive issues. So basically we failed uh, to do that. So probably maybe at some other time it might be able to happen, but quite frankly, um, there just weren't conditions for a meeting this time around. Do we have any more? No? Okay, do we have any more uh, questions? Or any well, I just want to say that um, AgriWatch has had many protests at the Gates Foundation headquarters from when before they moved and then when they, they're, I, I highly recommend and I kind of regret that we don't have time, but that you go to the foundation headquarters and that you go to the visitor center because it is, I mean, you got to go. It's just uh, a study in how philanthropic capitalism works. It's just, you just have to, you have to experience it. Um, and there's an opportunity to engage. Marianne had the opportunity to go and there's an opportunity to ask questions, right? Of, of, I should let you tell the story, but she was saying that she asked, well, if I leave a question, will Bill Gates actually read it? And he only looks at the questions once a year, apparently. So it's not a very effective, I mean, that's not a, a way. So in general, I would say that um, AgriWatch has, um, we have had some meetings that others have arranged that we have participated in. Um, we felt, you know, that it's, it's good for us to have some interaction with the foundation that's here, but um, they have been extremely um, patronizing to us as well and to what food sovereignty is about when we've been able to have any sort of engagement with them whatsoever. Um, it's been very unproductive. Um, so um, to this point, we don't really see that as a primary strategy. Um, but we do think it's important um, to, sh you know, show up at the foundation from time to time. And we've tried to deliver a letter that people had signed from all over the world. They wouldn't take it because it wasn't proper protocol. We, you know, we just kind of come up against the institution as a, as a kind of faceless, nameless place that we're not able to interact with very well. So that's mostly been our experience up to this point. Hi, my name is Matthew. Um, first of all, thank you for everyone on stage and everyone out here um, very much for being here today. Um, it's kind of been touched upon briefly, but I wanted to see what's the state of indigenous seed banks in Africa, either on a continent-wide basis or a country-by-country -country basis, um, if that is measurable. And um, are there any current outreach efforts to establish more indigenous seed banks uh, in reaction to AGRA? 
Hi, uh, my name is Travis. In 2009, I was fortunate enough to travel to Kenya and do research on the resistance to the Green Revolution in Africa, uh, where I had the pleasure of meeting Daniel. And um, I met with lots of great organizations uh, that were resisting the Green Revolution and building alternatives to the Green Revolution. But one of the things I noticed is that a lot of them weren't mentioning the Gates Foundation and the influence of the Gates Foundation uh, in their work. And when I asked about why that was across the board, uh, the organization directors answered that they were afraid to. They were afraid to get on the bad side of the Gates Foundation because it would impact uh, the potential for further funding. And I'm wondering if that culture still exists and how it impacts your work. I just want, I have a question on how you are addressing um, these with your leaders in Africa. I'm from Kenya and I, I was there for two months and my mom was really concerned in regards to if anybody's from Kenya, they remember the sugar cane we used to eat and the cassava and things have changed. So with all this new agriculture of, of Bill Gates and whoever, but I didn't at the time, actually I didn't know, but I, all I saw was a lot of export, rice export, sugar export from, and I'm, you know, I'm sorry, um, I, no offense, but from China. And, um, you know, that is, people tell you that if you don't want to buy the rice in Kenya, and, you know, grown in Kenya, there's rice cheaper than that, and it's coming from China. So all this issue and uh, importing and exporting with the lead and all that, how are you addressing that with your own leaders? Because your leaders are the ones that are opening these gates to the corporates coming into the country, and in reality, um, you know, doing some farming or whatever issues they're bringing in. Uh, the other thing is, uh, you know, in Somalia, the same thing is happening, I think, with the seas. You hear about these pirates and all that is polluting the sea, and that's what people are against. So in reality, Bill Gates or any other corporate from the Western is promoting um, uh, another fourth war in Africa, or as you say, the colonial, and, um, you know, in, and really, telling people that, hey, you cannot practice your inheritance. Um, when I was brought up, I used to, you know, every Saturday and Sunday go to my grandmother's farm. And that's how I, we used to generate my school fees. So in reality, what they're saying is whatever you inherited, um, you cannot uh, pass it to your grandkids and, and, you know, rather we are bringing new education to you and parents who don't speak English or don't understand that culture. I, you know, I, I don't understand how they're going to do that. But anyway, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you for some of those questions that really, some of these questions really uh, put many of the issues that we are working with on the ground uh, into focus. Uh, at the Kenya Food Rights Alliance, we are doing quite a number of things, and some of them, while on one side we are accepting the whole idea that uh, we have to liberalize the market, we have to farm as a business, farming is a business, we are also at the point where we realize many of our small-scale farmers are not able to compete with the bigger corporations, and so when the big corporations are competing because of the liberalization and WTO rules, we get many, much of our import from uh, Egypt through Comesa or even rice from Karachi, Pakistan, or even China. And unfortunately, this is also doing a lot of food injustice to the people. And the whole push to green revolution is also changing the way people are eating. And as I, I don't know what it is with the African genetic makeup. We tend to suffer from many diseases such as um, heart, heart, heart attacks, uh, high blood pressure, mainly because of the disruption of what type, of, what type of food we are eating. And so when you look at exports and the imports that are there, the whole market, there's no borders anymore. And that is part of what is causing food insecurity uh, all over the place. And yes, I uh, appreciate the sentiments that are coming in, whether it has to do with import of sugar or rice 
our seeds. Uh, the best way, like uh, Eric started saying, um, about 90% of our farmers feed the people. The, in Africa, the proportion of food imported just feeds about 10% in the rural, in the, in the cities. And so that is a big difference, and we have to live with that reality. Indigenous seeds, seed banks. Uh, my organization, Ethiopia, does that. Um, it's, a, it's a fantastic strategy to make sure that the local seeds are, they do not disappear and people could access them. And also, it's a, it's a, if you use it as part of a system, it's one of the ways to uh, uh, make sure that in situ conservation of indigenous seed is happening. But it's part of a strategy. The problem is there is an, uh, you know, a particular focus on it without, uh, with forgetting the bigger context. So it, it should be part of the bigger advocacy strategy. You know, it shouldn't be the goal. It should be part of the bigger goal. Otherwise, it's, it's one of the... Uh, fantastic methodologies, and there are organizations in Ethiopia using that system to strengthen farming systems. So, yeah. All right. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, the organizing for this event happened over, uh, and the vision for it and the actual organizing has, has taken several years and it's just, it's a great sense of accomplishment that it was so successful and um, that we all were able to learn so much um, from these really important organizers um, who've come so far. So um, we need to wrap up so that they can get some rest before our final day of meetings as part of the summit tomorrow. Um, and I know you all need to get home as well. So I just wanna say thank you so much for coming and please join me in thanking them once again for being here. Thank you.